but yeah, but yeah, back then it was crazy. We would just take a, you know, so uh, a common Biofmax tool is Blast for anyone that's in the field. Like Blast is this tool that just, you know, if you have a sequence and you want to search it in a database of a whole bunch of sequences, you would use this tool called Blast, just basic alignment, something, something search. I should know what that is. But anyway, very, very simple, straightforward tool. That didn't, uh, it didn't really exist back then, or, or it did exist, but it was still sort of new. And uh, so just this idea of taking a sequence and searching in a database was very computationally expensive. So I had to log into this crazy server and, and do that analysis, which would take, like nowadays, like, I don't know, I could do it on my phone, I guess. Like really? it would just be, yeah, or <laughs> or like definitely on like your laptop in like a couple of minutes. And then I was like logging into the supercomputer somewhere and and doing the analysis. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty crazy to see how y you start with those things. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So, yeah. So then I went to a PhD and mm -hmm. um that was great. That was in Vancouver. It was kind of nice for me too, because I'd grew up in a small town in, in New Brunswick. And um uh you know, that was my first chance to sort of get out of a sort of small town feel a bit. And so I went to Vancouver, drove across Canada with my wife at the time and uh, started my PhD work there. And that was in basically sort of next level up, I would guess. So I went sort of from st studying a single genome, and like a single fruit fly genome, to then I was starting to study multiple bacteria genomes, right? So, cool. you know, typical thing as you think about you know, bacteria is pathogens, right? Right. Uh, typically, so bad ones. Bad ones, and then you want to say, okay, what what makes this particular strain bad than this other one, right? Classic examples are like E. coli or whatever, right? Where you have, you know, some E. coli strains that are fine, and other ones that are, you know, obviously really bad. And so that work was to basically try to distinguish in the genome why these strains are bad and these ones are good by essentially looking at their genome and saying, okay, what's so different, right? right. And we were after particular regions that have horizontally transferred into the genome, right? So these things called genomic islands. Um, and so that happens in bacteria. You can get single gene transfer, but a lot of times basically you get this huge, you know, this large area of like 8, 10, 15, 20 genes all inserted into the genome. Okay. Yeah. What is the purpose of a genomic island? Yeah, well, uh, the idea is, I mean, uh, I guess the purpose evolutionary is, is it gives a fitness advantage, yeah. So you'll get things that are, um, you know, pathogenicity islands that are, you know, related to pathogenicity, and then, but you can also get sort of metabolomic, or not metabolomic, but like related to metabolism. So like just gives a certain advantage in a particular area. So you can just imagine you have a, yeah. you have a bacteria, it's it's pretty happy, right? But it you know it's struggling a bit, <laughs> and then all of a sudden in comes like this big chunk of DNA. It's got a whole bunch of genes, right? Not just one, and then there's a huge advantage to to sort of keeping that. How yeah. do they, how do they acquire that gene? Oh, through well, well the main methods of horizontal gene transfer are like you know competence, right? So you blow holes in cells and but some 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 bacteria are normally competent, right? So they just allow uptake of DNA. Other really? what, Yes. Goodness me, I didn't know that. That was oh, so interesting. Yeah. So yeah. They can so, just suck up DNA and integrate it into their machinery? Yeah, absolutely. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't of know that. Of course. <laughs> That's why I'm probably <laughs> been in this field for how long? And I don't know that. Is that really basic? Yeah, yeah. it's basic. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm 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 cool with that. That's with okay. Up, it's all good. It's a learning experience for me just as it will be for all the listeners, but I think that's so interesting. Well, no, so they do that. This there's three cool. There's three methods. So there's super that cool. one, uh, and then there's uh, transduction, which is basically when, you know, you bacteria have viruses called phage, right? Right. So phage infect bacteria and, uh, and, and kill them. And <laughs> yeah, good job. <laughs> okay. And then, but what happens sometimes is those phage, you know, when they kill a cell, they replicate, and then they package DNA into themselves. Sometimes they suck up part of the bacterial genome just by accident just oh my. and then it goes into the phage and then the phage goes to its next host wow and then they transfer th that dna from this one bacteria to another so that's that's horizontal gene transfer through uh, transduction wow yeah and, and then the last a, one there's a, a lot of phage right oh there's a lot of phage yeah and so it's just a numbers game it's very rare you're thinking well why would they do that well they don't do it on purpose it's just, it just because you're talking about like 
just tons of this, right? And it's just the so high, like it's low frequency, but there's it happens so much because there's so much of it. And then a lot of times it obviously doesn't confer an advantage to the bacteria, so it just right. sort of goes away. But if it does, well, then the bacteria is like, ooh, score. Like, plus that that bacteria that the phage went into has to survive, right? So it has to sort of like it. push it in and then also survive, and then bam, it's just like. It's a, you know, it, it, it it's like, it's like a like, king. It's just like, yeah, yeah, I survived and I got a new gene and it's like all my progeny now are just going to be like, yeah, score. Yeah. It sounds almost like a sort of superhuman type fictional thing. Like yeah. it goes and just sucks up all this DNA and some of it confers an advantage and then it levels up and then it might level up again. And then suddenly it's leveled up like 10 times. It's like a super saiyan. Have you ever seen Dragon Ball Z? Maybe not. Yes, yeah. I have. <laughs> yes, yeah, insane. yeah. Uh, I just think that's so cool. And, and there's conjugation last. So I just oh, want to round yeah, right if there's off. three, right? Getting so the conjugation, excited. I've got to educate everyone. So yeah. conjugation last one, that's when basically it's the closest <laughs> thing that bacteria get to having sex, right? They just, they come together, they form a little connection, and then they share share DNA between each other. Wow. Yeah. Didn't know that either. Yeah, bacteria are amazing. I always talk about it in my uh, antimicrobial like resistance um, stuff when I'm talking about pharmacology and about antibiotics and why does resistance rise up so much, right? Yeah. It's like not only do they, you know, just select and they, they replicate so much, but they can share DNA. You know, it's like me being like I can't play basketball, so I could either like, you know, hope that I get a mutation and my kids can play basketball or I could just go down the road, find like a really good, you know, this is it. Michael Jordan's like, you know, relative or something and share some DNA. And, and now I can play basketball really good. Like, or you tap back. into the matrix. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. yeah. I know Kung Fu. Yeah. Back to you. Got it going on. <laughs> I got it going on. Yeah. So this is super cool. I'm, I made a note to say, can we talk about conjugation and horizontal gene transfer in the context of FMT later. So sure. let's definitely do okay. that. Yeah. that. But yeah. just, just yeah. you, so you, I said yesterday, your talk blew my mind and we will get onto that once we go through your story. Yeah. But every time I learn something new about the microbiome, just like I've done there and I appreciate it's super basic sort of genetic stuff, but yeah. I'm just like, wow, this system is so complex. It is so yeah blooming complicated yeah. yeah you know and we've just been talking about bacteria and to be fair some phase but there's fungi in there as well isn't of course there? And yeah. it's all just interacting and feeding and eating and conjugating and horizontal gene transferring yeah. that's mad yeah now you're developing new tools to study all of that and that's super cool now before we get on to what you're doing now you want to just take us through to the postdoc and what sure. you learned yeah and so i guess quickly the, the phd was on these genomic guidelines. so at that time i it was my first foray into creating a bioinformatic tool, right? So I made this bioinformatic tool called Island Viewer, which basically allowed people to upload their newly sequenced bacteria genome and search it against other similar genomes, right? And identify these genomic islands. Uh, and it has like a little visual interface and, and, you, and you can upload genomes to it. And it's still going. It's like on its fourth version, like the PI kept... Um, oh, really? Yeah, she she kept doing it, Fiona Brinkman. So it's, People are using this? And people are still using it. Wow, yeah, so, wow. you know, but it was nice because it was like my first sort Congrats. of thing and it's still going, like like my baby's still going out there a little bit and being developed by other people. So that's that was really cool, really rewarding. And, that is you cool. know, it, just to come back a little bit about how much the field's grown, I remember at the time when I started my PhD, there was less than 100 bacterial genomes in NCBI. Uh, the NCBI is like this large database. So just the database that hosts all bacteria genomes, there's less than 100. And by the time I finished my PhD, it was at like 250 or 300 bacteria genomes. And I just thought, that's huge. Like that's a huge number of genomes. Because at the first of it, people were like, well, this seems kind of useful, but why don't you just, you know, you can just do that manually. I'm like, well, in the future, it's going to be, you're going to have genomes everywhere, so you're not going to have time to like, do it one by one manually. You just want to upload it and, and get it done. And, uh, you know, and of course now we have thousands, tens of thousands of bacterial genomes. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts. So yeah. Do we have all the bacterial genomes? No, of course not. No, no. no. How far away are we? Oh, that's hard to estimate, right? Um, mm, I can't put a number on it. There's been a few nice papers though, where they, they have done work on this, uh, comes to mind, my postdoc, actually supervisor in California, uh, Jonathan Eisen. So he had this project called um, uh, GIBA, Genomic Encyclopedia, 
Genomic Encyclopedia Bacteria and Archaea. And so they were trying to essentially expand, you know, the number of genome sequence, but not just in the same areas. So what happens right. early on is we focus on pathogens, and so we sequence, you know, those pathogens over and over. Uh, and, of course, you know, we know that, you know, that's limited by culturing, too, in the early days, right? Mm -hmm. So we were culturing those genomes, and then we're sort of restricting ourselves to those things we can culture. And so Giba was sort of focused on, okay, let's, instead of just sequencing more of these things, let's try to expand essentially the tree of life so that we can cover more diverse things and we get an approximation really of the full repertoire. But even then when that was published, probably 2004 maybe that paper, you know, they had this curve of, you know, you can imagine if you sequence more genomes, you can start to get an idea of if you're at the top plateau of this curve or not. And it was... It was not. It was wow. like, it was here. It was like here. And then the full thing was like wow, astronomical, like off the charts, right? Wow. Yeah. And, that's uh, and, and it's, it, well, it's environmental, right? I mean, so if we think about human microbiome, sure, we're, we're getting a pretty good reference database of, of microbial genomes in the gut. Um, but if we think environmental, I mean, there's just so, so much, much diversity. There's so much diversity. Yeah. Sequence any soil anywhere and you're going to find you know, stuff you haven't seen, like wow, 40% at least. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So the whole planet has microbiomes. Of course. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any area that, I don't know. I don't think there'd be any area that doesn't, you know, wow. they, they found, no, there's microbes everywhere. It's, you know, like deep sea vents. Yeah. There's, there's microbes there. These extremophilic microbes. Yeah. They're like 135 degrees yeah, Celsius. Like, it's insane. These they've done like these crazy cores at the bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. like <clears throat> some crazy distance. Again, I mean, I, I just don't know. And they, they dig and dig and dig and they like some crazy distance under the sediment and they, they sequence there. it and there's microbes. And they're like <laughs> they're like they're like viable. They're not just like relic wow. DNA. They're like you can grow them up. They're thriving. They're, well, I don't know if they're thriving, but like they're living and waiting for their moment, I guess, their yeah. moment of glory or something, or, or maybe they're never going to get a moment of glory and they don't realize it or something. <laughs> but like, yeah, there's low level metabolism. I mean, it just, it blows my mind. Yeah. It uh, blows my mind too. Do you yeah. think that there'll be bugs in space? <clears throat> well, uh, not that we will find right away, I don't think. No? No. Too inhospitable or? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I think because all of a sudden you get to this point where, I mean, that's life, right? So you're talking about life in space, right? I mean, I don't, that's the big question. When, when we think about life in space, we think about aliens. But I mean, the reality is it's just as big if it's bacteria. Oh, it's I know huge. people wouldn't be excited about it. People oh, wouldn't be like, I whoa. Would... But I mean, if we found any other life form anywhere else, I mean... <sighs> That's a huge jump. Of course, it'd be cool to have like intelligent life forms yeah. or something, like some animals running around. But yeah. or, if or we found, cooler than that, like yeah, some yeah, some, civilization, yeah, that'd be really cool, super cool. Yeah. But the reality is, I think if it's a distance thing, right? I mean, like if if there was actually life out there that we could get to, the chances are of them being simpler than us, right? Is right. like the time scale is just right. you know it it seems too similar. Do you know what I mean like? The time scale is too tight for that to really work well. Right. And, and I'm not saying that they'd have to evolve to something, you know, better. I'm just saying that they would, There's you think a, about how life started here, what, 4 billion years ago. So, but that time scale is quite small for, for life. 4 billion, is that what it is? Or 3 billion? I can never remember these numbers, you know, but it's, it's in that range, I think. Right. Right. And so, yeah, you, you would, I think you, we would have to travel really far. We'd have to be able to travel larger distance to to increase our probability of finding life elsewhere. Right. If that right. makes sense. It does. I mean, there's some theories to say that maybe the life here originated from somewhere mm. else and something arrived at some point in time. But yeah, this is the, I'm I'm not an expert by any way, shape, or form yeah. in this area. But I do like to ponder if there were microbes in space, what would they be like? And also, if there were microbes on one of the planets that we're trying to colonize, say Mars, yeah, um, how do we know they're not like uber pathogens for us? Oh, yeah. They could just be yeah. brutal. They could. And likewise, we might seed whatever microbiomes are on there with our microbiome 
and ruin whatever is there in terms of life. But. Yeah, I mean, I'd, unless it was like, you know, really a descendant of yeah what seeded us, which I don't think it would be, the chance of it infecting people are just probably unlikely. Because it's not evolved to do that. It's not evolved to do it. It's just like me trying to eat like, space rock you know like that's not gonna happen i mean maybe that's not a fair comparison but i don't know like it's it i think it's so it'd be so far out of their realm yeah i don't know maybe not so so, so so within the the human microbiome then in terms of diversity sorry we, yeah we I'm, have to bring it back I, here eventually I, well i could i could stay on space and aliens forever i am so interested in that um but this is inside matters and we're a microbiome gut health podcast right um, so in terms of human microbiome diversity yeah. You mentioned that we've got good maps now of kind of the various different things that have been cultured and have been sequenced and have been identified. But is there still some like dark matter in there? That, oh, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you're still going to you're still going to find new species of bacteria in the gut. Uh, definitely, obviously, new strains. Uh, maybe even like a bit more newer stuff than that, like maybe a whole new genus. I think is probably possible, but that's just bacteria, right? So if we talk about like phage, oh, like we, that's just wide open, right? I mean, there's some recent papers sort of studying that, you know, phage dark matter in the gut or other other areas, and so we're just scratching the surface there, right? So it's sort of, wow. I think the estimates around sort of ten phage per per one of bacteria is, is but wow. these, these are those numbers that are sort of thrown out there. I never know how accurate yeah. they are, right? But you know, it's- Because it used to be 10 bugs <laughs> to every human cell and then we were like, nah. Yeah, nah. Someone, yeah. I read that someone just literally did like a back of the napkin calculation and was like, yeah, it's probably 10 to one. Yeah, and then everyone used it for like ever. And then yeah. someone's like, maybe we should actually- We should, we should actually <laughs> check that. Check yeah. that. Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's funny because you still see some like, uh, I don't want to use any names, but like you see some publications that are like mainstream and that yes, yeah, ten cells to one. And I'm like, well, yeah. you've not really been keeping up to date. <laughs> yeah, have you? exactly. That's not true no, anymore. No. Um, so it's one to one, but then I guess probably flux is a little bit. I mean, if you go to the loo and you have a big bowel movement, you're oh, probably yeah. losing like loads of bugs. Yeah, no, I think you, right? that's the idea, right? Like, so you're sort of maybe one to one. At some point, but you can go a bit more microbial cells to human cells, and then yeah, I mean, it just comes post out. post morning. You're you're probably more human. Finally, <laughs> that's why you feel so much better. Like you're like, oh, I'm human again. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, well, you know, um, <laughs> it's really interesting that we just flush out so many bugs every day people don't realize. Yeah, they don't know how many bugs are on them, inside of them, and how efficient the colon is yeah. at basically allowing bugs to replicate, right? It yeah. has to be the most efficient fermenter system yeah. ever yeah. in the universe, dare I say. Yeah. It could be. I mean, I mean, I mean, there might be some other animals. I guess you'd, you'd have to argue that one somehow. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. The cow and the horse have got some cool stuff. Yeah, I got some cool stuff too. I don't know how you evaluate cooler, but yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a great system for them, right? I mean, they yeah. have a stable temperature, right. constant influx of, of lots of nice nutrients for them. Maybe not too much crazy competition because, you know, they got some new bacteria coming in, but they're sort of limited and... Yeah, they're they're all set. Really, it sounds like a nice home for them. Yeah, and I guess just for the listener, the the human microbiome, although it differs between each human, like there are similarities between the bugs compared to say what would live in a horse or what would live in a cow. Is that correct? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this it's always a hard concept to say like similar versus or core species, you know, because it's just a definition. But yeah, absolutely, like. We're, our guts are more similar than mine to another animal's for sure. That's right. that's safe to say for sure. Right. But there's more diversity between my gut and your gut in terms of microbiome than my genome and a banana's genome. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> let me think about this. Because there's, <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many, there's so much genetic diversity in the microbiome. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously we, if we're talking about genes and things, right. Yeah. We, you know, we, we sequence the human genome and, 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 the number of genes and, and microbes is way, way more, way more, yeah. way more, way more potential there. Um, we don't know what all the genes do yet, do we? No, no. Wow. No. So there could be cures and things like that that just live inside our body. Yeah. New antimicrobes. Of course. Yeah. 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 Lots of anti 
there's probably lots of antimicrobials there for sure. Because that's where a lot of our antibiotics came from in the first place, right? So Right. Yeah. Just living inside of us. Just living inside of us. The cure's there. Yeah. So in terms of discovering the cures, profiling the genetic genomic potential, this is where the bioinformatics and the sequencing comes in, right? Yeah. Because on the one hand, I suppose you could try and culture them all from everybody and figure out what they produce and so on. But that's probably not realistic or practical? It's not practical. It's the difficult parts. I mean, there is a lot of value in trying to grow them up and, and having that catalog, right? But it it you go from trying to do that one by one or some high throughput fashion uh, to you can just sequence it all and try to put it back together again. And it's not perfect. There's There's problems with that, right? Uh, but it's like a one-shot deal, right? So, I mean, if, if we get really good at now you're talking about sample, sequence it, you know, in a day or two, and if your Biomax is perfect, now you have every, you know, every microbe in there, genome all sequenced perfectly, and you sort of know the, the numbers of them as well too, right? Like, so you know, oh, there's right. eight of these and 25 of those, right. or, you know, at least double double this number or something. You mentioned bioinformatics and the word perfect. <laughs> those don't those don't go together. <laughs> I'm smiling and laughing because I am uh, familiar with your work. Yeah. Where you essentially have proven that they're not perfect. No. no and it's kind not. of it kind of well, it did blow my mind. I told you yesterday. You blow my mind. <laughs>